I'd like to introduce Sister Gloria Schultz. She is uh, the Sisters of St. Paul de Chart. Uh, Sister Gloria is a native Euchre from Bessemer. She's been a Sister of St. Paul for 43 years. She has a master's degree in theology. She's a teacher, a trained hospital chaplain, and a bereavement pastoral care specialist. She lives in Escanaba and is a district superior for the sisters in the United States. There are very few sisters here in the United States, but their numbers are 4,000 worldwide. Sister Gloria loves her life as a religious <coughs> sister and continues to respond to Jesus' command to care for those who are less fortunate. It is in this vein that Sister comes to us today to enlighten us on her order's mission and ministry from Bishop Noah Holm in Escanaba to Haiti and beyond. Let's welcome Sister Gloria Schultz. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today because I really do like the opportunity to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. And um, so I'm giving you an extremely nutshell version. So if there are things you really want to know that I'm not seeing, um, kind of make a mental note or a note somewhere to ask the question, and I'll go there. I'm going to try very hard to stick with my script for two reasons. One, if I don't, I will tell you all sorts of stories and add things, and we'll be here all day. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not mechanically skilled. And so if I don't stick with my script, the pictures won't even come close to what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm going to try to do that. But um, as you saw from that first slide, we were founded in 1696. And we were founded by a parish priest, Father Louis Chauvet, and one of his parishioners, Marianne de Thier. And we were founded in a small little town, city, outside of Chartres in France and it was called Loveville. You know, France had been ravaged by war for years when we come on the scene. And when I say years, I just will throw in that in that mix of all the wars was the Hundred Year War, and there were others. So they were really, it was really ravaged by war, uh, people were living in poverty, and they had no hope. And so there was no desire in their hearts to even try to improve their level of living. Well, the hearts of Father Chauvet and Marianne de Thier were burning to try to help the poor people in Loveville. And they wanted to open a school for girls as they were the ones who were most denied education there. And so the children were seen, of course, as the future and the only hope of lifting their level of living, Father Chauvet and Marianne de Thier thought was to educate them. Marianne de Thier was a teacher, and so she would teach young girls to become teachers. Three other women responded to this call to become teachers, and they were Mary Michaud, Barb Foucault, and Marie Therese Dutranche. Now, all four volunteers at first lived in their own homes, spending their days in service of the children and the sick under the direction of Father Chauvet. Then in 1699, with the blessing and encouragement of the Bishop of Chartres, Father Chauvet gathered these four young women as sisters, religious women, into a small house close to the parish church and drew up for them a simple rule. Now this house still stands and it's actually our first house, which was taken from us in the French Revolution and then some of our things were given back and this was one of them. So we still own this home and it's very special to us. So he draws them together in this house. He draws up a simple rule um, of life for them, and he had no intentions of founding an international order. This wasn't on his mind at all. 
He simply wanted these sisters who would work in his parish to help the poor. He wanted to raise their level. That was his intent. So he gathers them. And as every human organization, they have to have a leader. Then Father Chauvet appointed uh, the youngest of them as the first superior, and that was Mary Michaud. And she was only 17 years mm -hmm. old. You know, so back then to get married at that age was not uncommon. So in October of 1699, the free school was opened, and so many children arrived at the school that they couldn't even fit them in the house itself. So they went downstairs to the cave, as it was called, and today we'd call it the basement. And there in that cave, and this is what it looks like today as we fixed it up, um, they taught reading, writing, and arithmetic and catechism by candlelight. And it reminds me, I have to throw things in anyway, even though I try to skip, st stick to this. It reminds me of the first summer I taught Bible school in Trinary. Um, we were in the basement of the, ch well, I think it was the church, and it had a dirt floor and one light bulb. So I thought, hmm, really connected with Loveyville here. So, um, but anyway, the, the adolescent girls upstairs um, were learning how to sew and to cook so that eventually, because the goal was for women of those days to get married, that they would be able to change a house into a home, that they would know how to be good wives and mothers. Now, the sisters not only taught school, but they also went from house to house um, taking care of the sick and acted like social workers and um, they just cared for the, the people and prayed with them. And then in 1702, see so I don't have pictures for everything, I have to make them up. In 1702, a uh, fever swept um, the, uh, the whole area of, of Loveyville, but that whole province that was called the Bose Peninsula. And so, of course, you know, with the fever, death was everywhere. And so the sisters went to the homes of the people um, day and night, praying with the sick, um, praying with the dying, comforting those that were left when some had died, and trying to find new homes for the children who lost their parents. Then the 19-year-old at this time, because it's two years later, um, the superior, Mary Michaud, catches the fever and she dies. She died on November 15, 1702. And Mary Ann de Tia is named the superior and she dies a year later in September. Now that leaves two. Now I don't know about you, but if I were um, Mary uh, Therese de Tranchier part de Foucault, I'm not so sure I would have continued. <laughs> I don't know if I'm made for this. That didn't even cross their minds. And they lived out uh, a quote from scripture that will be very close and dear on the hearts of every sister of St. Paul. If a grain of wheat falls to the life and dies, it will bring forth much fruit. And in 1705, um, we have 14 new postulants entering the congregation. But it was because two brave young women hung in there in the darkest of times. You know, you've seen wheat on more than one occasion um, in my slides already. Wheat is a very important symbol to the Sisters of St. Paul because we were founded in Loveyville in, and there are wheat fields everywhere. And so it's in the wheat fields, and so we draw that symbol. Not only do we have the quote that I just used for you, but that whole sense of, of all the uh, imagery and symbolism that comes in the grain of wheat. Um, so it's, it's rich for us. So okay, so we have four girls who in the beginning respond to the call, and today we are almost 4,000. We are serving in 35 different countries, and since I did this map, 
a couple of years ago, it's out of um, date because we're now also in um, Nepal. So we continue to grow and uh, to expand in, in various ways. Um, our roots, you know, remain the same. The sisters today also give themselves to the work of charity. Marianne de Thier wrote in her last will and testament that she gave herself to God for the good of the church and the service of her neighbor. And thus, all the sisters of St. Paul throughout the world participate in the mission of the church to be of service to their neighbor. And obviously, they do that through the vowed life and giving their lives to God. Our first mission consisted in working to improve the human and spiritual level of the villagers by educating the girls and by visiting the poor and the sick. The same mission is continued throughout the world by the Sisters of St. Paul. And here's a quote from our Book of Life, which is our constitutions, but we call it our Book of Life, which I, I like a lot better than constitutions. Um, and it says, whatever kind of work they may be engaged in, the sisters keep in mind that their first aim in life is to further the growth of the kingdom of God. That is our goal. So why in the world did we come to the <coughs> Upper Peninsula of Michigan? <laughs> you know, uh, this is a surprise to many and some of our missionary sisters who are here don't know our story well. But we had been invited to come to the United States before this. And we did not accept it. One of the places we were invited to come was California. <laughs> you know, the time wasn't ripe, and the conditions were not always in keeping with our charism, which is to serve the poor and to go where others have not or cannot or do not go. Now, let me spell that out, okay? You saw that in Loveville, it was to open the school um, and to service, um, you know, all of the children, but with an emphasis on girls because they were the ones left out. So they were the poorest among them. All right, there were other congregations in, in Chart and the surrounding areas. There were no sisters serving in Loveville. So we go where others are not, cannot, or do not go. Well, we were invited by Bishop Noah to come and teach, to help out with the home for the age, which they, were, they wanted to open, which was the Bishop Noah home, where um, he had the dream that retired priests could go to if they chose to, and he also wanted us to open up a mother house in the Upper Peninsula. Well, um, I got news for you. Uh, no other congregation would even think of opening a mother house in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which may surprise you because we love it. We think it's great here. But generally, mother houses go to areas that are larger, are closer to places of study, connected with colleges and various things where there are feeders for vocations. So there's no mother house here. You have sisters here. And, and today there are not a lot of congregations uh, left in the Upper Peninsula, but there, in our history there were, but no one built their mother house. So we said yes to this. You know, the spirit led us to say yes, the time was right, we came. And as you heard, it was in keeping with our charism. It was like another love avail for us. So we started off, oh I forgot to show, see I'm already behind my picture. So anyway, this is Bishop Noah with some of the first sisters. That's the first habit we wore when we came to the United States. And as a matter of fact, it's too bad I didn't throw it in here for fun. When the sisters first arrived from the Philippines, they came in the cornet. So they had this thing, if you ever saw the flying nun, this was a little different, but it was on that order. They actually arrived in that, and the first time we switched to the veil was when the sisters came to the United States. So, um, so anyway, we, we um, opened up, um, you know, the, the diocese had purchased 
the old orphanage, and that's where the first Bishop Noah home was. Some of that history, if I had time, is absolutely fascinating in terms of what was charged in a variety of things. You know, our mother house wasn't yet built. How did I get, I goofed. Oh, there's the old orphanage, because that's where we first lived in Marquette. We, we moved into the old orphanage. At the time, it was basically empty except for 19 Cuban boys who were there as refugees and were in the process of waiting to be placed in foster homes. And when they were placed in foster homes, uh, this was closed and we were asked to move out. And our mother house wasn't built yet, so the um, novitiate went to Ishbiming and lived in the old St. Joseph's convent there, which was uh, on the list to be torn down. And we were able to stay there, and I say we because that's where I entered. We were able to stay there until our mother house was finished in 68. The professed sisters moved into the old convent of St. John's, the French church that was there. And that was uh, due to be torn down before the mother house was finished. So the dear sisters of St. Joseph of Crondelat in St. Michael's Parish took our sisters in. And they didn't even have enough bedrooms. So Sister Cormac, some of you might remember that name, those of you who have um, been around for a while, <laughs> Sister Cormac <laughs> slept on the couch in the community room. And so she had to wait until the sisters were done with their recreation and whatever they were going to do in there. And then when they all went to bed, then she could go to bed. Um, their beginnings were tough. And I look back to that often and see the wonderful missionary spirits they arrived with and the many sacrifices they made without ever complaining. And I remember when Mother Gabriel, who was um, our superior general, came to visit and her English was good, but it wasn't perfect. And I remember her saying, you know, um, I'm, I'm very worried. You eat too few, you sleep too few, um, because she was looking at the sacrifices they were making. And um, I remember them well, because I lived with them as a, a postulant and a novice and a junior sister. Um, so I lived through those beginning years with them. As you know, um, I'm not sure what in the world slide I'm on, so I better check this out. Oh, I'm supposed to be showing you this. In the United States, you know our numbers are small, and unfortunately, in some ways, they keep getting smaller. Um, but um, I say unfortunate, but we are in God's plan. And, um, you know, uh, we just, I keep telling the sisters, our role is to you know, our first aim to do, to, to live for the kingdom of God and to live our religious life to the full, the best we can in service of God through the church and our neighbors. It, it's, so it's, it's, it's relatively simple. So let me tell you a little bit um, about the beginnings. When we came, you already heard me say that we went to the Bishop Noah home, but we also went to Menominee to teach school and in Marquette at St. Christopher's for many years. And so um, this is, we started off at the Bishop Noah home in the old Delta Hotel. And the, the diocese eventually does not want to keep the Bishop Noah home. So they offer to basically give it to us, but it's done through a sale thing. Um, and we take over sponsorship. And then we continue to discern and look at the situation and we decide to build a new Bishop Noah home. So this is the aerial view of, of the, the home that exists in Escanaba at this time. Um, it's easy to see, I think, how the Bishop Noah home is in keeping with our mission and are going into schools to teach. Um, but it's an opportunity, particularly at the Bishop Noah home, for us to serve the poor. Um, everybody at the Bishop Noah home is not materially poor. But the fact is, as they're dis diminishing and are unable to do for themselves 
and uh, there's tons of letting go on every level. They are, are poor in today's world. The other thing that is of extreme importance, as far as I'm concerned, we are the only Catholic nursing home or home for the elderly in Escanaba, and for that matter, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And for that very reason, we get some people that come as far as from downstate. Um, and we are fortunate because um, many nursing homes are sitting with open beds and we have a waiting list. So we are very fortunate. I find that working with the elderly is very sacred work. We were aware that in the beginning, God created the world and our Savior follows us to the end so that God again has the first word and the last word and it's the same word and that is let there be life and so we have the privilege of being there of being midwives to help um, our elderly who are elderly who are ready to return to God to make that journey to pray with them to be with them and it's it's a gift to them but it's more of a gift to us to be able to journey with them and to be there and to also to be there with the families. Um, I want to repeat a sentence that I said to you um, when the fever struck in 1702 and I said with death striking everywhere the sisters were in the homes of people <coughs> day and night caring for the sick, praying for the dying, comforting those who were left and finding new homes for the children whose parents died. This is what I believe we do at the Bishop Noah Home. It's a wonderful ministry. So, a little bit about the Bishop Noah Home. This is, I'm way behind with my slides. I was going to follow this nicely, but I didn't stay with my script. <laughs> so, this is life. This is the Bishop Noah Home. Now I'm up to, to par here. Um, it's a 109 bed facility, in case you don't know anything about it. We have um, uh, the home for the, well actually it's independent apartments today is what it's called. And we have the, the nursing home section and we also have um, 31 apartments, um, independent living. And so, um, and we're in the process right now of planning some major new renovations. Um, as we look to the future and better serving our residents, and among them is we have way outgrown our chapel. Uh, at daily mass, uh, we probably average like 25 wheelchairs. And so we're kind of coming out the door and breaking <laughs> fire regulations and whatever, so we need to do something about this. Um, and it is one of the key reasons that people come to the Bishop Noah Home because fortunately, with the wonderful assistance of the priests in the area, we're still able to have mass every day. They come in and anoint uh, once a month. Uh, their service to us is absolutely phenomenal for which I am deeply grateful, deeply grateful. Um, so uh, it's a big help. Uh, we also have a Protestant service um, once a week. So, and, and our ministry obviously is across the board. We have one Jewish member who shares his prayers and vice versa and even comes to mass. It's, it's quite interesting, yes. So that's a little bit about the Bishop Noah home. You know, at this time um, in history, we're seven sisters that are assigned at the, or are living at the convent at the Bishop Noah home. However, um, only three of us are there right now. So out of those two, one is me, and two of the other sisters, Sister Therese and Sister Rosalie, work at the Bishop Noah home. Then I have a sister, the one in the wheelchair, who has, is now 97, and she is actually a resident in the Bishop Noah home. Up until this summer, 
She came home every day for um, Vespers and the evening meal when we were not at work. But as of this summer, she's in bed. Uh, her, her, her situation is deteriorating. I have um, uh, another sister uh, who isn't in this picture, but she had a stroke. Um, and uh, she was in New Jersey on a leave of absence taking care of her mother with tongue cancer. And so she's returned to us to rehab at the Bishop Noah home. And then I have two other sisters on a leave of absence taking care of sick members of their family. So we only have um, three of us that are actually um, in ministry at this moment from the Bishop Noah home. And there you see some of the kinds of the things that we do. Our mother house out on County Road 492 here in Marquette. We have four sisters assigned at our mother house, but that's going to change very rapidly. Uh, it's actually changing. Sister Rosaline, some of you may know, is from Thailand. <coughs> She's home on her home visit. <coughs> Excuse me. And as you know, uh, there's been a lot of flooding there. And uh, her mother's home and uh, um, her sister's and both of her brother's homes have been destroyed. She has called Rome asking for assistance because that's where our general it is and of course we're going to give it. But during the call, Mother Miriam asked her, would you like to return to Thailand to be closer to your mother, to assist her in this time of need and also to function as a nurse because there will be many sick people with all the, the polluted water and to that she said yes. So she will be coming back in January basically to pack up and return. So we'll be down to three. Um, we have one sister there that serves in pastoral ministry um, and she works out of St. Peter's Parish and uh, its services uh, bringing communion to Marquette General Hospital, Jacob Eddy and three other nursing homes besides the homebound. Um, we have sisters who volunteer in religious education and um, let's see, in, uh, in that top left hand corner, Sister Claire is 82 and still teaching and loving every minute of it, I mean volunteering. In, in the religious education program. And then uh, we had two sisters at Sawyer, and that's gonna cut down to one, so we're looking at, at that ministry. And they do things like Bible studies, um, uh, feeding the poor, they have soup and sandwich once a month, but it's growing so rapidly they may increase it. Uh, they have um, free bread that's picked up from Econo on Sundays and distributed on Mondays. Uh, there's a store in Ishbiming that gives food, and um, so a lot of outreach there to the poor. And then they have things like special functions and saying of the rosary and so on. Then we have a house in Bethesda. Well, not in Bethesda, excuse me, in Washington, D.C. Um, but we have, they're teaching uh, actually in Bethesda. I've got one sister who works at a large hospital as the chaplain. These are the three sisters there. Um, uh, it's a 900 bed hospital, so she's a hospital chaplain there. Uh, Sister Nanita is a first grade aide, and Sister Estella is helping the secretary in the, in the parish. And so we find that the ministry she does on the phone, and when people arrive in the rectory, very important. Because they'll be calling for masses, and of course, then the reasons for the masses come out and a lot of, uh, of ministry goes on that way. Um, and then we have other activities that they get involved in like the, the March for Life, the trips to DC with our youth and the World Day of Youth. Got the Compassionate Hearts Club. I'm gonna just do this one quickly and then I'm gonna stop um, because the time is up. Um, we started, when I went to Rome, I asked mother, I said, I know that it is our custom to send whatever excess money we have wherever we are to Rome because you know better the needs of our sister and the people. But I'm asking you, would you please give us a country? 
because we need a focus and Haiti was given to us. I also asked to take on a project in Venezuela to help with safe drinking water that have nothing to do with our sisters and then we took on one project in the Upper Peninsula. We formed a club called the Compassionate Hearts Club. Um, it has become um, uh, an annual thing that the campus ministry helps us to do that mailing every year. And I can't tell you how I look forward to it because the stories that are shared and the spirit of uh, the youth are, are just, it's touching. I just, this is what we have taken in in the Compassionate Hearts Club, which I think is phenomenal. And it's because of many generous donors. Thank you, Sister. That was wonderful. I think we probably only touched the iceberg. I mean, barely touched the iceberg of all that you do. I uh, did. So thank you. Uh, you know, so I mean, uh, uh, yeah. I talked too much. Thank I you. add. I said, I'm going to stick to my script. <laughs> thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions for Sister? Then I just flip over. We do these. These are in Haiti. Bishop. Sister, you, you mentioned the Cuban refugee boys that came uh, from Cuba. One of those boys is now the auxiliary bishop in Brooklyn, Octavio Chisneros. Ah! He graduated. He, well, while living there at the orphanage, he graduated from Nagani High School and went on to the seminary. And now, for about five years, he's been the auxiliary bishop in the diocese in Brooklyn. Wow. That's, thank you for saying that. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Yes, Sister, could you tell us a little bit more about your work in Haiti? I'd really like to know a little yes, more. Yes, I could. We have 29 sisters in Haiti. We operate seven schools and one health clinic up in the mountains. Um, we have um, Sister Marianne Cruz, who is a doctor, a um, mission there from the Philippines, and does just absolutely amazing work. By herself, she sees between 30 and 50 patients a day. Besides that, she has formed connections all over, and so she helps with feeding programs, um, distri distribution of blankets and all sorts of things. Um, sponsors herself, and I say herself because she gets the money, and, and we contribute a lot to her, um, various students, and um, they all come back or in the process. She also teaches them how to garden because she said, um, when they come to me not well, I maybe can fix them physically, but if they're starving to death, what good is it? So, and since the earthquake, we have also opened two small orphanages. Yes. What type of uh, cooperation, if any, is there with the Catholic Social Services here at the Marquette or Young Finisley area? Um, for Haiti? No, for, for Catholic Social Services. I'm not sh I don't know right off the top of my head. I mean, I know there's a close connection with Catholic Social Services in Haiti. I mean, they have, they have been very generous with our sisters and helped a lot. Um, but I don't personally work with, I hate to say that, so I don't, I don't even know if you know any more, Bishop. I, I don't know any common projects. So. so, sorry, I don't know the answer to that, so probably none. <laughs> 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 any other questions? A little thing I'll throw in because we also have sisters in Japan and we actually had a school and sisters right in Sunday. Life is very difficult for them. They're doing the best they can to go on, um, but many are still living in shelters. Um, they do not have a clue yet what the effects of the radiation are really going to be. So the head of our congregation has wanted to go to visit and the sister says, please do not come. We can't risk something happening to you. So, um, but they're finding life there still very difficult. Very difficult. Yes? I think it's important that the people who are here know that any of the funds donated to the sisters, especially for Haiti, goes directly into health. It doesn't go through any, um, there's no overhead. No overhead. Um, no. I mean, when we do the mailing, the sisters pay for it. When we do the trips and various things, the sisters pay for it. 
Um, some people have given money and that have said could be used for anything. And so when Sister Frances goes, because each time we go in, you can bring less and less luggage. And so we do pay for whatever luggage they're going to allow us to bring in. And some people do give money for that, but otherwise we wouldn't even be taking that from the money that's given. It goes directly into the ministry. Um, some people will give to sponsor a child's tuition and uniform, which is $200. It'll go for that. If they sponsor a teacher, if it's going for food, whatever they specify, it goes for, it gets there. And up until now, um, we've actually been bringing the money <laughs> ourselves, so we know it gets there. But recently, I needed to get some money in there in a hurry because Sister Marianne Cruz needed more money to, than she thought she needed to get a vehicle to get up and down the mountains because what she's been doing is very unsafe. And she sometimes needs to transport her patients as well. So we were able to purchase a vehicle and so I needed to get the money there rapidly. I did a wire transfer and they got it just fine. I knew though from Mother Miriam that wire transfers were fine. Shipping or sending anything Unless we bring it, no. That's one of the challenges. Sister, where do uh, individuals who are interested in, in joining your order, where, where do they go for formation? And what is that process? They go to our mother house in Marquette. In Marquette, okay. Yes, they do. Um, at this point, Sister Frances, I don't know if you know her, is in charge of our formation program because we actually have two young women who are very serious and um, we'll be spending at least a year um, back and forth, them looking, us looking. Um, we'll do discer a serious discernment together. Once they make up their minds, their postulancy and novitiate will be in Marquette. Postulancy lasts six months and the novitiate lasts for two years. Um, the novitiate is the canonical training for women religious that's required. And um, at that point, at the end, if they choose, they take their first vows. And then they have a five-year period where um, they, they are what we call a junior sister before they take final vows. So there's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to continue to discern, to live, to take a look. Um, yes? Before we finish, could you just um, tell us about Sister Mary Ann Lauren and what she's doing? I know a lot of us are I her. absolutely could tell you a little bit. I'm in um, pretty uh, constant dialogue with Sister Mary Ann. Matter of fact, I got two emails from her this morning. But um, she is working as what we would call our first assistant to Mother General, Mother Miriam, um, on the council. And so she serves in Rome. She's serving a six-year term so it will actually end in August of 2013. She's got a ways to go yet. So as somebody who is really an English speaker, even though she speaks French, she's been assigned to help out mostly like in the countries where they speak English. So according to the needs and what's decided for the year, which countries are going to get visited, and when and so on. She travels a lot around the world. So um, she's been to many different countries. And um, when she's there, it's um, meeting with the sisters one-on-one um, uh, -on -one for those who want to see her, and then giving some talks. And, um, and then we have these renewal programs in Rome for our sisters, and so she would be part of that team and do some of the teachings and um, and she's a major help to me because I don't speak French and I can talk to Mother Miriam who supposedly speaks English well it's pretty minimal and I get <laughs> off those conversations and I'm saying now what does she really mean you know and, and so Sister Marianne instead I call her and she then tells mother in French. <laughs> so we really communicate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister. Uh, I'm sure Sister will uh, hang around for questions if you want to talk to her afterwards. But we have to stick with our schedule here.